Good morning, Word Surf. Hey, we are in a sermon series called Broken for Us, and it is a great introduction to this idea of Lent and the Lenten season. Lent is a time to prepare us as we march down that road towards Easter. And the good news is Easter. Everybody loves Easter, but there's a lot of stuff that goes on between there. And if we just skip to the good parts, we miss everything that Jesus did for us. He was literally broken for us. And so it bears a little bit of time for us to see exactly what he's done for us, uh, not in an effort to cheaply invite you to say, oh, I should be grateful to Jesus, I should do what he says. That's not our intent. Our intent is to reveal what has been done for us, what is being done for us, and then to let you decide what your response to that is going to be. But I can guarantee that if you connect with Jesus at this level, your response is going to be amazing. It's going to surprise even you, I bet. Where are we going in this series? Well, we have started <laughs> with the covenant. So if you missed that last week, feel free to go back on our YouTube, on our Facebook, or on our website, wordserve.org slash sermons. Today we're going to talk about cost, and then we're going to talk about a bunch of other C's, because once you get started, you can't name one without a C, or it would feel left out. So that's what that's, what that's about. Today we're going to talk about the cost of Jesus, and I want to start with this question. Have you all ever done a cost-benefit analysis? How many people have done this? Perfect. All right. So yeah, you may have done this in a variety of things. Maybe it was a cost-benefit analysis for a job you were considering taking. Uh, maybe it was for a house. Do I move out of this house into another one? Do I move from my apartment to a house? Maybe it was a car. Like, hey, this car's costing me too much. Do I just go out and buy a new one and not have to deal with all this maintenance nightmare? Maybe it's a kid, like, eh, military school versus... No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Well, maybe I'm not. I don't know. You tell me. But there's a lot of cost-benefit ratios that we do all the time. Some we think about heavily and some we don't really. It's just like, do I eat the donut or do I not? Right? That's, that's a pretty small risk. But let me ask you this. Have you ever done a cost-benefit ratio analysis with Jesus? Have you ever analyzed the cost of following Jesus? Well, if not, you're in a great place because that's what we're going to do today. If you want to follow along in your Bibles or newly repaired Bibles, uh, Mark chapter 8, verse 31 is where we're going to start. And as you're turning there in your app or in your Bible to Mark 8, 31, let me give you a little bit of the setting here. When you talk about the cost analysis of following Jesus, is this a good thing or is this a bad thing? Let me give you the setting that takes us to this point because right before this, amazing things have happened. By the way, if you're a gospel fan and you are like, give it to me straight, short, and to the point, Mark is your man. He's the shortest gospel there is. He's probably also the first recorded gospel. So you get it straight, you get it short, and you get it first. What's not to love, right? So in Mark chapter 8, hopefully you found time to turn there now. So look at what has happened before all of this. Jesus has done amazing things. He has, fe he has fed thousands. He has healed a blind man. He's healed a deaf person. He's got thousands of people following him. And then he pulls his disciples aside. And you, you, you see this great trajectory. Look at what's happening here. All these wonderful things. Jesus is surely the Messiah. And so you're ready for the, prep, the pep speech here to his, to his uh, disciples. And that's what we're going to read today. Um, for those of you who don't know, I put one question up for the entire uh, scripture. right? And this is what I want you to contemplate for today. So I'm going to actually read the scripture. You can listen or you can follow along. But this is what I want us to think about today. So remember this. Trajectory has been tremendous. Thousands of people following. Here comes the pep speech to the disciples. Ready? Here we go. This is Jesus talking. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law. He must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have things in mind of concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples, and he said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit your soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange 
for their soul. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. These are the words of God for the people of God. And for these words, we are grateful. What a great pep, pep speech, right? Pep speech. What a great pep speech. After all this trajectory and everything that's going on, Jesus has this giant downer. And the disciples are going, what? I had plans. I left everything for you. I left the family business. I left the future. I left some family behind. They're probably struggling right now without me. And this is how you're going to end this story? You've got to be kidding me. I would be right there with Peter. I go, hey, Jesus, let's have a little talk. You can't be saying this stuff. You got a following. You got thousands. You got thousands of followers on Jesus' book, whatever it is, right? You can't be saying these things. But here's what I love about Jesus. No matter the circumstance, no matter what it might cost him, no matter anything else, he tells us the truth. And the truth is, he's going to be handed over. He's going to be killed. And, and if I'm with the disciples there, I'm probably going, no, no, no. And I didn't hear the last part, which is, and in three days I will rise again. See, we miss that part sometimes. We don't want to hear that bad news, even if it's truth. We just want to go right to the good stuff. So I'm sure at that point the disciples are probably thinking, whoa, a quick cost-benefit ratio here of continuing to follow this guy. This is what he's thinking is going to happen. And look at Jesus' reaction. <clears throat> he, he calls Peter Satan. I mean, I can't think of a worse insult from the son of the living God, right? He knows <laughs> exactly what that means. The guy with whom Peter is going to build his church, the rock, the one who, to whom he is handing the keys of the kingdom, he calls him Satan. Why would he do that? Get behind me, Satan. The answer is right behind his words right after that. Get behind me, Satan. You're not thinking about God things. You're thinking about human things. Lift your perspective. There are more things happening here. And that's what we've got to focus on. And if I'm honest... I'm right there with Peter. I'm thinking about me things. I'm not thinking about God things. I'm not thinking about what it might cost me to, or what suffering might have to happen for God things to happen. But I will guarantee this. When God things happen above when my things happen, God things are always better. Not just for me, but for everybody. I think Peter is going to learn that lesson, but we have to get there first. So today, Word Serve, I want to ask you, are you willing to do a cost-benefit ratio of following Jesus with me, a cost-benefit analysis? If so, <clears throat> let's kick off. What's the cost? We're going to have two columns. One cost is to follow Jesus. One cost is to not follow Jesus. What does it cost to follow Jesus? He tells us in his words right here, there are three main requirements. He says in these words to follow him. The first is to deny ourselves. How many people want to sign up for that one? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some people go, well, my life's pretty terrible. I wouldn't mind denying myself. But that's not what we're after. Right? This denying of self is basically to say, I'm going to set aside my agenda. I'm going to follow his. It does not mean that I'm going to be uh, horribly emaciated, never comb my hair, eat locusts, and wear camel, you know, whatever, like John the Baptist did. That, that's not exactly what this means. Denying of self is putting something else first. A lot of people are afraid to do that. Oh, God's just going to grind me into the dust. No, no, actually, if you read the Old Testament and this thing called the Ten Commandments, that was his kind of guideline, right? And I'm not, we're not going back to say, oh, we're going to go back and follow the law. But what I'm saying is, if you look at people like, uh, here's a good example, Daniel in captivity in Babylon. Remember, he goes to the king and he says, hey, you're asking us to eat your local food. We want to eat what God calls us to eat. Give us an experiment. Let us try it for a little bit and let's see how it works out. And you know what? David's people were healthier than the king's people. It's amazing. And even inside those Ten Commandments, there's this one little thing of all the Ten Commandments. Only one of them starts with this phrase, remember, like we're not supposed to remember the other nine. Like, remember what? Anybody know? The Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath because God knows that we're going to forget in our stupidness. And we're going to grind ourselves into the dust. He's not the one doing that. If we truly follow God, if we truly follow the purpose for which we are made, we're going to be living into our true selves. 
what we were created for. We're going to be happier, healthier, uh, more in our well-being. I say happier is probably not the, that, that's kind of an elusive thing. But we're going to be well. We're going to be whole. We're going to be restored. We're not going to be ground into the dust in following God's commands for us. If, we're doing, if, we, if we find ourselves in that position, if we're following God and we find ourselves ground into the dust, we're doing something wrong. And that causes us to come back and look right here to find the answer. So the first one, deny self, is really to put God in charge. And after all, isn't that the way it's supposed to be? <laughs> uh, when did we get to be the boss? That rarely works well. So deny yourself. That's the first cost. The second one is take up your cross. Who wants to sign up for that, right? This is the thing with Jesus. He's got only so many words. I mean, paper wasn't pretty common back then. You know, you had to just cut to the point. Take up your cross. And a lot of people go, well, I just have to, you know, I'm going to suffer amazingly. I'm just going to be, you know, put to death and all these kinds of things. Maybe. Maybe you're the one in a million that Christ is asking you to sacrifice your life for the sake of the gospel. But you know what I kind of find is more common? It's not those big things that he's asking us to do. It's the many little things that he asks us to do. Take up your cross doesn't mean to uh, punish yourself or to, to live in a state of constant misery. The taking up of the cross, we talked a little bit about last week. When, when criminals were condemned to die by the cross, the first thing that they did on the way there was they took and carried the cross through the town. And that was designed to show the entire town that this is a criminal. This is a shameful, disgraceful person. And so taking up your cross doesn't mean physical suffering necessarily. What it means is being willing to be rejected like Christ was rejected. To be willing to be disdained like Christ was. To not be ashamed of your father, even in those circumstances, if God is at work, there will be something good. It's just being willing to bear the shame or the rejection that Jesus did. That's taking up your cross. Then the last requirement that Jesus mentions here is to follow me. Well, <laughs> have you seen where Jesus goes? I don't know if I want to follow him there. It's scary. Could be hazardous. Could cost me my life. Could cost me my friendships with the people that I know and love could cost me a lot to follow this Jesus. Go back to the Bible and look at where Jesus goes. Would you go there? Would you go to the places that Jesus goes? Would you say and do the things that Jesus did? I tell you, I, I wouldn't. I'm just being honest with you. If I was in this place and this time and he asked me to do this, <clears throat> I probably would not do it. But here's the beauty of this. God doesn't ask us to do it. God asks to work through us to do it. It's never just us. We're not alone when God calls us. God also equips us. Follow me. We never know. We never know the big picture. And here's a great story. Many of you uh, may be familiar with the name Lee Strobel. He was an author who wrote The Case for Christ. It's now a movie. Uh, Lee Strobel was a journalist in, uh, a long time ago before he came to Christ. He actually wrote that book as a result of his investigative journalism to prove that Christ wasn't real, that Jesus was not the Messiah. He did all this research, research with tons of people, interviewed, flew all over the country, and got all these expert testimonies. And you know what? As he sat down to gather all the evidence, he came to Christ. Is that not amazing? So if you haven't read The Case for Christ, or if you haven't seen the movie, I highly encourage you to see that. It's, it's a wonderful transitional story. But here's the thing. Lee, shortly after coming to Christ, still working at the newspaper, felt God calling him to go and talk to his publisher about Easter. Easter was coming up. This sounds familiar, right? I wonder who you're going to invite to Easter. Well, Lee said, I felt Christ telling me to go invite this publisher to my church that he had just found, he'd just been saved, for Easter. Who doesn't go to Easter, right? Well, what's not to love? And he knew that this publisher was a devout atheist. Right? He had nothing, no time for God. He didn't want any of that. And so he ignored it. And then God kept prodding him, kept prodding him, and kept prodding him. And finally said, all right, look, I'm going to go and talk to the publisher. I'm going to invite him to Easter. So he marches into the office. He goes, hey, you know, he explains his conversion. He explains the church that he's got. He explains Easter's coming up. He says, I know that maybe this isn't your thing, but would you just come and try it with us? 
And guess what happened? The guy said, absolutely not. <laughs> You're always expecting something different, right? You're expecting this, oh, the heavens parted, this guy came to Christ, everything was good. He goes, no, he, he basically threw me out of the office. And it made things really difficult for a few weeks because there was this awkward exchange every time they went past each other. And Lee goes back to God and he goes, God, why did you ask me to do that? You've made things weird. <laughs> Have you ever been there? <laughs> things are weird. And, and so for like the whole rest of the time that he worked there, he eventually, he moved on. He's done other great things. He never understood why God would ask him to do that. It just got weird. Until about 10 years later, Lee is on his book tour. Now he's written this. He's a best-selling author. And this guy comes up to him and he goes, hey, I want to thank you for the big difference that you've made in my life. I accepted Christ. My family accepted Christ because of you. And Lee's like, uh, I don't know you. Uh, so, so what's the story? He goes, well, you may not remember this, but I was an electrician. I was called to work on a building and I was on my hands and knees in this publisher's office working. You probably didn't even know I was there. Then I heard you come in, and you asked this guy who you knew was an atheist to come to Easter. And you explained everything about your conversion and how special Jesus was for you. And, and I know what he said to you. He said, get out of my office, go away. But I was listening. I hadn't been to church. So I, I got up from that thing. I went and I called my wife and I said, hey, I think we need to go to Easter services. She wasn't a believer either. They both came to faith at that church, as did their entire family, and then began a life of serving God. Who knew? I'll tell you who knew. God knew. That's why he asked Lee to go into that office. It wasn't for the publisher. It was for the unseen electrician. I wonder how many unseen electricians there are in our lives when God asks us to do things. We go, no, this, this follow you stuff is too tough. You're asking too much. Is he? Let's continue our analysis. So these are what, this is the cost of following Jesus. The cost to not follow Jesus is to lose our soul. Wah, wah. <laughs> Whoa, wait a minute, what? <laughs> lose our soul? Are you kidding me? No, I'm not kidding you. He says it right here. What does it profit you to gain the entire world and lose your soul? Well, let's talk about this soul. What's the big deal? Do I care if I lose it? Is it that big of a deal? Let's talk about what the soul is first. Now, sometimes the best way to talk about what something is is to talk about what it's not. So if you've heard this word, what is soulless? Now, for those of you who are uninitiated, I like to talk with people, not at people. So this is actually audience participation time. So I'm going to encourage you to think of either a person, an organization, or a society that is soulless. Soulless. And, and please don't say Word Serve Church. <laughs> well, you can say Pastor Bill, but not Word Serve Church, right? All right, so think of a person, an organization, or a, a situation that is soulless, without soul. Got a picture in your mind? Great letter rip. What did you see? Hollywood. Hollywood. Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood. What was it? Hitler. Anything else? <laughs> Does anybody here work for the IRS, by the way? <laughs> you're welcome, by the way. <laughs> yeah, so, so maybe, maybe you're too shy to say what you said, or maybe this experience of talking back and forth during a sermon is new to you. If so, come and get used to it, man. It's fun. I love these things, because what you start to experience is what is out there and is common to us, but we haven't put a voice to it. Something that is soulless lacks a certain ethical or moral foundation. That would be my definition. It's something that is without purpose and meaning. It, it doesn't glorify God to be soulless. So that's a good starting point. Now, I will tell you that in the Bible and in all the literature, there's a big differenti differentiation between the soul and the spirit. I'm not going to go into that today. I'm just going to kind of wicker us down to cut to the chase to say the soul is that inner thing. This is the outer being. What is the inner thing that makes you, you? That's the soul that I'm talking about. Now, Jesus talks about the value of the soul because right in the text that we read today, he says, what good is it to, for you to gain the entire world? Pause and think about that for a moment. If somebody came up to you and said, you know what? I'm going to give you Amazon 
and Google and Microsoft and the IRS and <laughs> all these things. You can have it all. Jesus himself, who knows everything, says it's not worth it. It's not worth your soul. Jesus places the value of the soul above the entire world. This soul must be very valuable. Who would know better than Jesus? There's some other places that we know. The soul is made in God's image. How many other creatures can say that? Are they made in God's image? Or are we the soul? <laughs> what I did there? Are we the soul ones that are the soul of God? That's, it looks better when you spell it out because you can see it that way, right? <laughs> Here's the other thing. The soul does not cease at death. That soul is the thing that keeps going on. And so a lot of people, when they do their cost-benefit analysis, they go, you know, you only live once. You've got to really seize the gusto. You, YOLO, you only live once. Go for it. Now, here's what I say in return. Yes, you only live once, but you live forever. You live into eternity. Where do you want to live into eternity? Doing whatever or following Jesus? That's really what it boils down to. Yeah, you only live once, but it lasts a long, long time. So think about that. Jesus himself, he says, Jesus, these are the words of Jesus. I am not making this up. You can look here in Matthew 10, 28. Don't fear those that can kill the body. Who should you fear? The ones who can kill the soul. Don't worry about your body. That's temporary at best. Nobody gets out of this thing alive. I hope you know that, right? That's, you know that. But the soul continues. Jesus himself says that. And Jesus' actions speak louder than his words. Go back to the time when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. There were three temptations. Does anybody remember what the last temptation was? Satan takes him out and says, look, look at all these kingdoms. I will give all of this to you if you will just bow down to me. If you will make a deal with the devil and sell your soul, I will give you the world. What does Jesus do? <laughs> He says no. I mean, there's more to it than that. But yeah, that's the, that's the bottom line. He says no. It's not worth it. How many times do we settle for something less than what God has for us? How many times do we look at the bright and shiny and ignore the brightest and shiniest? I do it frequently. I'm chief among you. I can give you all kinds of ways to not do this. But the bottom line is the world, the entire world, is not worth it. Our soul. And the thing I love about Jesus, not only does he tell the truth, but they have a saying. It goes like this. Actions speak louder than words. Jesus doesn't say that your soul is more valuable than the world. Jesus shows the very same thing in his last temptation. He refuses the world. So what price are we willing to pay, word sir? For the cost of following or the cost of not following? This is where it gets interesting because I think the church in America particularly is committing Solicide. Solicide. Not suicide. Suicide is a physical body. It's a very permanent solution to a temporary problem. Solicide is the killing of our souls. How does this happen? It happens in a million different ways, but I want to highlight just one verse, and then we'll go through a couple of others. First Timothy talks about this uh, thing that divides us from God, and he talks um, specifically about godliness, contentment, and wealth. Now, why do I say this? Because I think the church in America, this is probably one of the main things that we struggle with when it comes, with, uh, when it comes to our relationship with God and our contentment. We struggle with this idea of wealth. Now, I'm going to caveat this. I'm not saying having wealth is bad, but it, it can lead to some bad things if we don't manage it well. Here's what 1 Timothy says. This is Paul writing to his young protege. He says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Here's what the problem is. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people, eager for money, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Do you remember what we talked about last week about piercing? Piercing is the consequence of sin. Well, God took that away from us. He, he pointed that away at his son, Jesus Christ. 
But when we put wealth and the love of money as our number one, we take that right back on ourselves needlessly. And we pierce our souls. We're committing solicide at record numbers, I'm convinced. Here's some other ways that you do it. Maybe you recognize some of the things on here. Riches and pain was the first one, the passing pleasures of sin. A lot of sin is just a distraction. It's a desire to escape reality. Look at any addiction. That's what you're trying to do. Look at most of the things that we do. We're trying to escape the current reality. But you know what? You got to come back to reality. And it hasn't changed because of what you've done. The other thing that sin does is it separates us from God. So while we're taking our, our, our momentary escape from reality, we're also taking a momentary separation from God. And if we do it often enough, a momentary separation can become a permanent separation. And then where will we be? Other things, false doctrines. Yeah, I would love to tell you whatever it is that you want to hear, but you know what? i got to preach the truth. Because sometimes the truth is not comfortable. Sometimes the truth says, yeah, there are thousands of people following us, but guess what? I'm going to die. I don't, <laughs> I don't revel in that. I don't want to tell you the bad news, but I will tell you the truth. That's my pledge to you. And sometimes the truth can hurt, but Jesus' truth always heals, even if it hurts. More on that some other time. We also commit soul aside by not learning. Hosea 4, 6, the prophet back in the Old Testament said the people destroy themselves. God's not doing a thing. The people destroy themselves because they have no knowledge of God. They're not trying to learn about God. They're not trying to follow God, and they end up destroying themselves. That doesn't sound like a place I want to live. And then the last one is neglect. I call it soul atrophy. If you remember, there's a parable of the talents that Jesus tells where uh, people were given different levels of talents, and some of them went out and did great things, and they got a 100% rate of return on that. But one guy buried his talent in the ground. And when he came back and dug it up and gave back exactly what he had been given, what was he called? Does anybody remember? Uh, a couple of really lovely terms come to mind, like uh, wicked, lazy. <laughs> he didn't take what God gave him and do anything with it. And so he gets that taken away and it gives him to the others. And he's called wicked and lazy servant because he neglected his soul. Lord, sir, let's not be in the company of those who commit soulicide or soul atrophy and neglect our souls. So how do I do that? Glad you asked. Basically, we deny ourselves. We pick up our cross, and we follow him. And in the end, the analysis looks something like this. The cost-benefit analysis says, yeah, it costs to follow Jesus. It costs more to not follow Jesus. What good is it to gain the entire world, word sir, and forfeit our soul? The best place we can be is where Jesus calls us. That doesn't always look like it should, right? So I mentioned Daniel earlier. The best place that we can be is where Jesus calls us, where God calls us. It was better for Daniel to be in a lion's den than to be one of the most powerful people in the kingdom of Babylon, the culture of the day. It was better for Daniel's friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be in the fire than it was to be popular in the culture of the day. Where is it better for us to be? I don't know, but I know one thing. It's better for us to be where Jesus calls us. Is it the valley of the shadow of death? Great, he's there. His rod and his staff comforts us. There is no better place to be than where Jesus calls us. There is no better way to be than the way, the truth, and the life. Follow Jesus or not. As for me, I will follow him. Will you pray with me, please? God, thank you for giving us a light to follow. Thank you for giving us Jesus himself as an example. As we count the cost, God, we can't even imagine what the cost was to him know it was great and we know that he knows it was going to be a great cost and he did it anyway God, for that we will be forever grateful we can't say thanks enough but we can pledge to follow you today 
and never turn back. And even if we do, you will pick us up. You will pluck us out of the pit. You will place us on solid rock. And you will show us the way. Thank you, God. We love you, Jesus.